Welcome to the LSU NCBRT Preparedness Podcast. I'm your host, Ashley Markle. I'm a curriculum development specialist here at NCBRT, and I work in collaboration with subject matter experts to create valuable and timely training for the responder community. The National Center for Biomedical Research and Training provides mobile training to both the national and international emergency response community. Today on the podcast, we're kicking off a new series highlighting some of our incredible instructors and subject matter experts and talking with them about their lives and careers. We'll begin this series with a longtime collaborator and friend of the podcast, Roy Bethke. Roy recently retired as the chief of police in Cherry Valley, Illinois. He spent nearly 28 years and retired as deputy police chief in Buffalo Grove, Illinois. He chairs the Education and Training Committee for the International Association of Chiefs of Police, and he is also a subject matter expert and instructor for LSU and CBRT. Thank you to Roy for coming on the podcast and sharing with us today. To start us off today, can you give us a little bit of history of your background and how you got involved in NCBRT? Thanks, Ashley. That's a, a fun, fun question to think about. Um, so I'd been a cop, started as a police officer in uh, 1988 at a community college and then went to uh, Buffalo Grove, the department that I spent uh, nearly 28 years at. I spent 17 years as a patrol officer, had, you know, all different assignments, uh, patrol, crime prevention, was a detective for a while. And then after 17 years, I got promoted to sergeant. And uh, when I got promoted to sergeant, I ended up uh, losing my seniority and going back to the midnight shift. And interestingly, when I went back to the midnight shift, I encountered a, a group of much younger officers, less experienced officers um, that I realized thought about life very differently than I did. They thought about not just life, but work as well, work-life balance. And uh, what does work ethic look like and collaboration? You know, we were relatively independent. I'm a, a Gen Xer, a latchkey kid, uh, was very independent as a, as a young person. And certainly that translated well into my law enforcement career. But this younger generation really wanted more collaboration. They wanted to say in what it is that they were doing, what their, their job looked like. Uh, and I was ill-equipped to deal with that. I, just had no idea like how to how to manage that because it was so different than me. Um, I started studying generational leadership uh, and, and read a ton of books on it and found a bunch of information on it and realized there are a lot of things that I as a manager, as a leader could do to help uh, these young officers kind of uh, adapt to the workplace. And, and I had to adapt as well and how I communicated with them, how I gave them feedback. So that led to uh, speaking at a couple of conferences, and one that I spoke at is the International Association of Directors of Law Enforcement Standards and Training, IADLIS, in uh, Portland, Oregon. I don't remember if that was uh, late 2012 or early 2013. Um, but one of the people in the audience is a guy by the name of Steve Williams, who's a former associate director at NCBRT. And after the presentation, uh, he came and talked to my colleague and I and said, you know, NCBRT is struggling with some of the same issues. We've got an, an older, more senior executive team, leadership team. Uh, a lot of the instructors that taught for us then and, frankly, that teach for us now are older, retired at the end of their careers. And a lot of the employees, a lot of the, the staff kind of managing day-to-day -day operations was a lot younger, uh, fresh out of LSU, fresh out of school, and uh, it was creating some difficulty in communication and thought uh, they could improve things. So we flew down to uh, NCBRT and spent the day working with the, the leadership team uh, kind of in two parts, trying to help everyone understand that, you know, different generations have different perspectives based on life experiences, uh, different desires, different wants. Had some really, really good conversations. And uh, apparently the conversations were good enough that before I left there, Tom Tucker, who was then the director uh, of NCBRT, asked us to uh, become subject matter experts and, and join the NCBRT team. Uh, and the rest is literally history. That was uh, nearly 10 years ago. Hard to believe. And I'm curious, um, you know, th the idea of generational differences is a fairly new idea that, you know, we're looking into. Um, what were the reactions from, you know, some of the, um, I guess, maybe people in, in your generation or older generations when you kind of brought these ideas up? It's interesting. So uh, I think older generations, and, and I remember very distinctly when I got hired at my police department, and I, I didn't click until a lot later in life when I started studying this stuff. But I remember starting at the police department, my uh, chief, who's a, a great person, uh, Leo McCann was his name, is his name. Um, 
I walked into his office and sat down and I remember looking over at a bookshelf. He was a, a, a reader uh, of all sorts of content and he had a three ring binder and on the spine, uh, there was a label that said dealing with generation X. And I was like, well, that's interesting. Right. And, and again, it didn't mean anything to me at the time, but later when I started studying uh, different generations, I realized that, you know, apparently there was conflict. He was a baby boomer. Uh, and I was Gen X. So apparently there was some difficulty in, in baby boomers dealing with Gen X. So this idea of different generations in the workplace and, and looking at things differently isn't new by any stretch of the imagination. I think it's taken on uh, a life of its own for a variety of reasons. Uh, social media is a big part of that conversation. Obviously, uh, I'm a little older and grew up in an era where social media wasn't the thing. Um, but, you know, you hear it today still, especially from Gen Xers who are now in leadership positions or you know, baby boomers who are still around is, you know, these millennials, well, they, they think differently. They have a different work ethic, uh, which is true. But if we really stop and think about it for just a second, and I always like talking about the, the trophy generation, um, you know, everybody's heard the whole participation trophy thing. And I'm not a fan of participation trophies. I have uh, two kids, two teenage boys that uh, are active in sports, golf and soccer, uh, and they know my take on it. Listen, there's no awards for participating. You have to put in a really solid effort. And frankly, in life, there are winners and losers. And we see that in, in law enforcement profession every day, right? Sadly, uh, sometimes we're on the losing side uh, of some of these issues. But the reality is that it was my generation or baby boomers that came up with that concept based on, you know, some, some bad research, not necessarily bad research, but poorly uh, understood research, much of it by Dr. Carol Dweck uh, around growth mindset, where she said that effort is really important and we should uh, praise effort. Some people in my generation, coaches in particular, parents took that to the next level. Well, let's just give out a trophy for everyone that participates. And see, you hear that, you hear this idea of, you know, work ethics. Um, I know one of the struggles in the law enforcement profession is uh, getting people to arrive at work on time. Uh, which is just one of those things that I, I chuckle at. Like, I, listen, I was raised by uh, German immigrant parents. Uh, my dad was very much the, if you're fi not there 15 minutes before your appointment or before you're supposed to be there, you're late. Um, we actually, when I was at Buffalo Grove, we actually had to remind people that, you know, roll call time when it starts, let's say it's three o'clock, that you're supposed to be like in uniform with your duty gear on, your duty belt on, all of that, not just walking in the door on the way down to the locker room. Um, but those are some of the same struggles that that we hear today. I think the, the biggest challenge is that, you know, a lot of people in, in senior leadership positions in law enforcement think that this next generation needs to change, whatever the next generation is, right? Millennials, we're still interestingly talking about millennials, but let's be honest, uh, millennials are in leadership positions in a lot of agencies. Some of them are in their, their 30s, right? Um, we got Generation Z coming into the workplace. That generation is somewhere 18, 19 years old. Uh, they're coming in the workplace. And, and a lot of managers are thinking, well, Gen Z is going to be a, a lot like millennials. And they're not because they've had different life experiences um, growing up. And, and then let's throw the pandemic uh, into it. And, and, you know, our response to the pandemic, everything is is different today. Uh, so, uh, you know, it's an interesting conversation. And I think the reality is we have to embrace differences and, and people who are going to be leaders in organizations, regardless of if it's law enforcement, fire, EMS, uh, or the private sector. Uh, we have an obligation to learn and to change and to be the best version of ourselves possible. And that means we need to understand different people, not just based on generations, but based on uh, backgrounds and, and a variety of other issues. So it's, it's a fascinating topic still. Thank you. So um, can we dive a little bit deeper into uh, the most formative experiences during your time in law enforcement, because um, you're just you're coming right off of retiring again. Um, so if you could tell us a little bit more about that, I think that would be really interesting. I did. I think I've been retired now for about a week and a half uh, for the second time. So I think to understand the formative uh, experiences in law enforcement, I think it's worth talking a little bit more about uh, my upbringing and some of the challenges, um, you know, I always laugh when I speak at conferences or have conversations with people about, uh, you know, the, the typewritten words that are on a resume or a bio when someone introduces you to speak. Uh, and I'm always fascinated because like when I listen to someone read my bio and listen, I'm the luckiest person on the planet. I've had unbelievable opportunities in my career and through NCBRT to go places, meet people, to go to training. 
Um, but I, I listen to them read the bio and I think to myself, well, who's that dude? Because I want to meet that dude at some point. Um, but the reality is that, you know, what's not on the resume are the failures, the things that that make us who we are. It's not the successes. It's always the challenges we had. So uh, I was raised by uh, immigrant parents, came here and they came here in 1960 from Germany. Uh, I was born in 1967, grew up on the north side of Chicago, about a block and a half from Wrigley Field for any uh, Cubs fans. It was, a, it was a great, amazing place to grow up. It's obviously very different today than it was uh, back then. Then we moved out to the suburbs and uh, that was, it was rough for me. Um, I was a, a, an only child and uh, had some, a variety of challenges, played sports, was, was decent at a few of those sports, um, went off to high school and uh, in high school initially had some difficulty making friends. Um, but by junior year, I had a, a really tight, really close group of friends. Uh, during our senior year, uh, one of my closest friends uh, took his own life. Uh, and anybody that has followed NCBRT podcasts knows that I speak a lot about mental illness and I do a fair amount of work in that space uh, because sadly I have a lot of experience in that space uh, in a variety of reasons. So uh, after my friend took his own life, I uh, went through some really, really difficult and dark times in my own life, uh, made some decisions that uh, I'd like to say that I regret, but I don't know that I can regret them because ultimately they made me who I am. And I'm pretty happy with who I am and who I've become. But I do some things differently, no question about that. Uh, but some of those decisions put me in a position where I chose to drop out of high school. Um, 17 years old when I did that. Uh, didn't really have a plan. Was working, you know, part-time job here, part-time job there. I was selling appliances uh, for a while and, and car electronics and stereos and that stuff. And, and kind of during that phase... One of my uh, other good friends said, hey, I belong to this program at the Niles Police Department called the Explorer Program. So the Explorer Program is still around. It's uh, Boy Scouts of America, kind of a, a career type of club to see if you know people might be interested in some specific careers. And, and well, I will never forget the, the first day I walked into the Niles Police Department as a, a police explorer. And I was just enthralled by the, the officers and the cool gear that they got to wear and you know, the police station, the police cars, and, and you know, learning about what they did um, was really cool to me. So that kind of motivated me. Um, and at the time, I had another friend who uh, whose mother had a PhD, a doctorate, and really pushed me to get my GED and go back to school. So I had applied at uh, Oakton Community College to become a security guard. Uh, and they actually had a program that allowed you to take college classes um, while working on your GED. So I enrolled in some law enforcement classes, ended up finishing up my GED, got hired by Oakland Community College as a security guard. Well, this is probably 1986 or 1987. I, I wish I could remember. My memory's not that good anymore. Um, ended up working there for a little while. And uh, just before I turned 21, they had an opening for a police officer position. So in Illinois, community colleges uh, can have actual fully certified police officers on staff. So they offered me that job, sent me to the police academy. I had gotten my GED, which is one of the requirements, uh, was working on my associate's degree in law enforcement and uh, went to the police academy. And uh, mine was, uh, it was 10 weeks back then, which is almost hard to believe. Uh, there's a lot of conversations about law enforcement training. And, you know, some states it's 26 weeks, a half a year. Well, no, I just changed theirs to 14 weeks to think I, I had 10 weeks of training. Uh, is mind boggling. So I went to the academy, worked at Oakton Community College, I think for a year, year and a half. And uh, I think right around the time I came out of the academy, I tested for the Buffalo Grove Police Department. And you want to talk about things being different. Um, you know, recruiting and retention is a major issue in the law enforcement profession right now. Um, the department that I just left that I ran, the last time we ran a testing process, we had 23 people show up, um, which is just shocking to me because when I got hired, when I started and tested, uh, there were more than 800 people that took that test uh, that I think was 1988, that test was, or late 87. And uh, I was lucky enough to make the list. Um, and when I say make the list, I kind of laugh because the list had a hundred and some odd people on it. Um, I was number 27 on that list and thought to myself, I'm, you know, I'm never going to get hired. They're not going to have 27 openings. Um, so I was working at Oakland Community College and, and, you know, some time goes by from that testing process and I get a phone call from one of the commanders at Buffalo Grove. He's like, hey, we got to you uh, on the list. Uh, some other people got hired at other departments and, you know, would you come in and, and talk to us? So I went in 
met with the commander, and uh, I'm to this day I'm convinced that they were just looking to get to the next person because he was already uh, an employee, and they wanted to hire him and send him to the academy, the person right after me. And uh, what changed was the commander found out I'd already been to the police academy and already been certified, so they didn't have to send me away for training for for 10, 10 weeks. It might have been 12 by then because it was changing. Um, so they ended up hiring me and the person after me, and they sent him to the police academy while I got hired uh, and went right out to the street. So that kind of helps, I, th- I think, our listeners understand, you know, my background, my my fascination. Uh, I have no other word for it with uh, mental health. Um, you know, in the, the almost 28 years I spent at Buffalo Grove, I had an opportunity to do uh, just about everything at least once from, you know, crime prevention, technical services, a couple of stints on our uh, regional SWAT team, which at the time was the largest in the country. It may still be um, mostly in a a technical services role, a support services role, because I have a bit of a a technical uh, aptitude. I like uh, tinkering with things and fixing radios and taking things apart and then never being able to put them together. Um, So I did some of all of that uh, at Buffalo Grove. But, you know, in every law enforcement career, you have those calls that uh, you'll never forget. Um, and for me, it was always uh, the ones that revolved around death or revolved around uh, people taking their own lives. And again, obviously, I have a soft spot in my heart for that. Uh, and I've watched, you know, what the profession can do to a human being. I mean, this uh, this is a hard business to be in, uh, as is the fire service, as, in, as is EMS. And, uh, you know, I've, I've lost kids. I've had kids, very small kids, infants uh, die in my arms. I've had, uh, you know, older people, grandparents. Uh, die trapped in a car while I'm having conversations with them. And those are the ones that stick with you. And at the end of the day, what I realize is that uh, human life is incredibly fragile. Um, And I think uh, we need to do as good a job as we can to not only care for the people in our communities, but we need to do a better job caring for the people in our organizations because they're seeing this and they're dealing with this uh, day in and day out. And, And to be clear, Buffalo Grove is an upper middle class community. We didn't have um, a crime problem. I think in my t- almost 28 years there, I think we had five, maybe six homicides in all of that time. So we're not talking about, you know, Chicago or uh, Rockford, Illinois, which is uh, near where I'm at now. Like they have shootings every weekend and people getting shot. Um, you know, so it's not like that. And I don't know, given how much impact those types of calls and those situations had uh, on me and my fellow officers, even when we ignored it, even when we were afraid of the stigma that comes with asking for help, um, you know, when I think about a lot of the agencies and the things that they, they deal with on a day-to-day basis, um, it's staggering to me. And I don't know that I could have handled handled that for 28 years. It's a, it's a long time. So, you know, those are the things that, that stick with you. And uh, one of the reasons I'm so passionate about talking about mental health is we really need to continue breaking down the stigma and make sure that people are comfortable um, getting help. And, and, you know, talking about the generational differences and kind of linking the things together, right? So you think about um, baby boomers, even Gen Xers, you know, that was just part of life. It was part of what this profession, these professions dealt with. And it was just the the suck it up and move on. Um, And we realized that that isn't super healthy. I talked about, you know, the the trophy generation. In the same vein, when people start talking about, you know, millennials or Gen Z not having the same work ethic uh, as baby boomers, I, I, I sometimes like, want to slap myself in the head and, and say, well, you wonder why they don't have that same work ethic because we worked ourselves to death. We signed up for every hour of overtime we could get because we were chasing money and the better life in a house in the suburbs with the picket fence around it. Uh, except that in the interim, um, the divorce rate in law enforcement is extremely high. Um, the suicide rate is extremely high, higher than the normal population. Um, you know, talk about the rest of the train wrecks, right? The alcoholism issues that exist uh, in this profession, in the fire profession. So I always say, you know, millennials uh, in particular, when they looked at us and, and they looked at, you know, our lives, well, maybe their work-life balance, their different perspective on work-life balance, even in the law enforcement profession, is because they didn't want what we got. They didn't want to be divorced a couple of times and, and have these train wreck lives. They're nothing but stressful and, you know, eating fast food and crap just because it's convenient. Um, so in, in a lot of ways, my generation, our generation, the struggles that we had, we caused millennials to think differently and for, for people in leadership positions to think that, you know, we were the gold standard, that that people should have the same work ethic as we did. And it's illogical to me. 
in every way possible. Um, so I know higher education is very important to you. And um, can you talk a little bit about how that has impacted you and the different choices that you've made in your career? Yeah, education is one of those fascinating conversations for me because I was the anti-education guy forever, right? Here's a, a high school dropout. Uh, and I used to argue all the time because we got extra points on our sergeant's exams for having an advanced degree, an associate's, a bachelor's, a, a master's. And I was telling the story about uh, the associate's degree. So, you know, I signed up and I was uh, pretty close. I think I was one class short um, and, I, and I stopped going to school because I had what at the time was my dream job. I was like, I don't really need the associate's degree. Um, it wasn't until 1995 that I went back to school and finished up that one class to get my associate's degree. And I said I started in, I think it was 88, uh, working on this, 87, 88, working on the associate's degree. Um, but you know what I realized uh, after I got promoted to sergeant, I talked about this this generation gap and, and becoming a sergeant going back to the midnight shift. What I realized is that um, there's a lot of research and a lot of data out there uh, that can help people figure out how to be the best managers, the best leaders that they can be. And I had the good fortune of attending uh, Northwestern University's School of Police Staff and Command. And uh, I, I say good fortune now. I can tell you up front that I hated almost every minute of it. I hated the trip down there. So it's in Evanston, Illinois. My wife and I were a young married couple. We had uh, young kids, two young kids at home. My mother uh, was living with us and uh, my commute down to Evanston every day for 10 weeks uh, was somewhere between two hours and three hours, depending on traffic and road construction. So, you know, some people had the opportunity to stay down in Evanston. My department didn't allow us to stay uh, at any classes that are that, are that close uh, because of Buffalo Grove was a lot closer. Um, but that actually ended up sparking my uh, desire to continue learning. You know, we got some college credits for going to that uh, 10-week uh, super uh, school of police staff and command as well. And uh, while I was finishing that up, um, decided I was going to uh, finish up my bachelor's degree. So I started looking for programs, found a, a great program at Columbia College, and uh, signed up and, and did some online courses, some in-person courses, and uh, decided to get my bachelor's degree. You know, what's what still is funny to me about that bachelor's degree is, you know, I got most of my uh, law enforcement classes out of the way early because I took that, I got that associate's degree in law enforcement. So a lot of technical courses. When I went back to get my bachelor's degree, they were almost all gen ed courses. So here I am trying to get an advanced degree and I'm back to learning about biology and math and, and stuff that, you know, I don't know was uh, was super helpful for my law enforcement career, but I had an end game. Uh, and that end game is I wanted to get a master's degree in criminal justice. Um, and I couldn't get a master's degree, obviously, until I got that bachelor's degree. So I sucked it up uh, with the support and help from my wife, uh, finished up my bachelor's degree, went on to uh, get my master's degree. And, and to say that getting a master's degree for me was life changing um, is probably an understatement. And it might not be that way for everyone. Uh, but for me, it opened an unbelievable amount of doors. Uh, gave me credibility that a high school dropout certainly never had. So if you take that along with my life experiences, the opportunities uh, that I had, really everything changed after I got that master's degree. Uh, that was, I think it was 2011 or 2012 that I got that. Uh, again, started speaking at conferences, was passionate about training, uh, not just, you know, technical or tactical training. I've been a, a firearms instructor uh, since I think 99, 98, something like that. So always had an interest in in training. I was a training sergeant for a couple of years uh, in Buffalo Grove, which really kind of sparked that interest and helped build some of those relationships. Um, but what a what a great opportunity! What a what a great business and career for a high school dropout to end up uh, with the opportunities that I've had. So it's it's been a it's been an interesting run for sure. Thank you. So to wrap up today, as you look back on your career and look towards the future of law enforcement, can you shed some light on um, your lessons learned and give some advice for the future generations? Yeah, I think my first piece of advice is uh, don't take no for an answer and chase your dreams. I mean, that really is the advice. It doesn't matter what what business you're in, whether it's you know law enforcement or something else. Is, um, there are always going to be naysayers out there. Uh, I've had a lot of people say no to me about a lot of things. Uh, and, and sometimes the way that they say no uh, is painful. It hurts. Um, 
and sometimes we just need to spend a couple of days, a couple of minutes, a couple of weeks kind of dealing with that, getting over it, getting over it, and then figuring out what you want to do. Uh, but at the end of the day, you're responsible for your own success. And I think that's the biggest lesson for me is that I remember talking to a lot of different people, you know, well, the department's not training me, the department's not giving me this opportunity, not giving me that opportunity. Listen, if you're waiting for your department or your organization or NCBRT to like make you a better person, that's not their responsibility. Like they, they do have a responsibility, don't misunderstand me, but ultimately you're responsible for your own success. So whether that's going and getting a, a higher education degree, a master's degree, a doctorate, um, which isn't for everybody, by the way, whether that's learning you know, something new, uh, at the end of the day, there's so much material, so much information out there on the internet. There's so many amazing books uh, on every topic you can possibly imagine. Um, you know, the one big caveat that I would throw at that, though, is that just because it's uh, printed somewhere, just because somebody says it on the Internet, doesn't mean that it's accurate. And, and if if one thing uh, really sticks with me for my master's degree is, is understanding and having the ability to look at research and to vet and verify research from opinion. There's a lot of opinions out there about a lot of different things. But if you're going to go to the Internet and search something or if you're going to read a book, uh, make sure that it's a properly vetted source. At the end of the day, uh, there is no greater profession, in my opinion, than law enforcement. Now, I say that uh, just finishing my 35th year, and I also, you know, as I said, retired, I think, a week and a half ago, hopefully for the, the very last time. Uh, I think I've paid my dues. I don't know that I have the, the capacity or the energy uh, to serve as a, a police chief anymore or any other role. Um, but man, when I look back at the opportunities that I've had and and it's been absolutely amazing. And, and, you know, one of the things, one of the projects I worked on at Buffalo Grove that I thought was pretty interesting was uh, as people were retiring, uh, we asked them voluntarily to go on video and, and to kind of answer some of the questions that you've asked me, like, what are your greatest lessons? What, what's the greatest success? And um, it was interesting, even the most disgruntled employees and every organization has them right in policing, we call them retired on the job. Um, the disgruntled, angry people, boy, when they when they came down and, and voluntarily recorded those videos and, and answered questions like, you know, what are you going to miss the most? And it was always the people, always the people, right? I'm not going to miss the circus, but I'm going to miss the clowns. Um, the reality becomes, though, that, you know, don't let little things consume you. Let the little things stay the little things. Worry about the big things and fix those big things. Not everything uh, is that important. Not everyone's opinion of you uh, is important. Uh, but ultimately have fun because, uh, boy, 35 years, when I think about that for just a second, I can't believe how fast that went. I mean, there, there were a lot of long days, and I, I subscribe to the theory of uh, long days and short years. Uh, when I look back 35 years, I think to myself, I cannot believe what's happened. And I have the same thing when I when I look at my amazing wife. We've been married more than 20 years. Like, I can't, I, I blinked, and 20 years went by. Uh, it doesn't mean we haven't had some hard times and life has been easy. Same thing with my kids, a 16-year-old and 8-year-old, 18-year-old. Um, I remember holding them when they were babies and I blinked and uh, I've got one off at college and, and one that's some kind of golf phenom. Uh, so I, I guess my biggest advice is don't let life pass you by. Take control of it. Do things that you want to do and figure out what makes you happy and go chase it. Thank you to Roy for coming on the podcast to share his knowledge with us today. If you have any questions or topic suggestions for future episodes, please send us an email at podcast at ncbrt.lsu.edu. Make sure you subscribe to the LSU NCBRT Preparedness Podcast wherever you listen to podcasts, and we'll see you again next time.